Well, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me here in Riga. It's always a pleasure to be in this beautiful city. I'm going straight into my topic. Uh, to start with, I should say I'm a consumer lawyer. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. So, um, I'm, I'm safer on the first part of my presentation, and then I move on slippery ground. So <clears throat> I'll just talk a bit about who I want to talk about, which is powerful private actors, um, see what powers they have on, or what their effects are on consumers, look at traditional private law, and then I, as I said, try and make a move forward um, before I offer some conclusions. As a provisional criterion, I want to not define, describe powerful private actors as um, some, or the pro uh, provisional criterion is market dominance and therefore power to exclude consumers or consumers, citizens, people, whatever you want to call them, from a relevant market or part of social life or to impose unfavorable conditions on consumer citizens. So as candidates, uh, well, we could think of the, the usual suspects, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Amazon, Spotify, Net, Netflix, um, credit rating agencies, uh, in Germany that's Schufa, famous. Um, so the, this is sort of the area that I want to talk about. I'll get back to become a bit more concrete on them. <clears throat> What can they do for or rather against consumers? Uh, one of their powers is, of course, to exclude them from their services by simply not entering into a contract with them or by blocking or deleting an account. Well, that relates, of course, to Facebook, YouTube, and, and the likes, Twitter. Um, in terms of unfavorable conditions, I um, want, talked about personalized pricing. It was mentioned already in the last presentation, but that, of course, is... Um, a highly topical and highly controversial issue nowadays. And um, more from a background perspective, some of these, and this relates in particular to credit rating agencies, they can create conditions um, through which third parties exclude or grant unfavorable conditions. So they sort of create the atmosphere, the circumstances, which are then taken up by others to do all the above, in particular by profiling, um, exploring the preferences, etc., and by calculating a credit score. From a consumer perspective, all this, and in particular when it comes to automated decisions, um, this causes a sentiment of arbitrariness, and in particular when they don't know why exactly they are excluded or why exactly they are um, given a, a credit at a more a less favorable con uh, condition than others, other consumers. And this is the sort of sentiment of arbitrariness is what I want to look at. From a private law perspective, this is mostly all fine. If we look at it in a traditional way, we have party autonomy, freedom of contract. Freedom of contract in includes the freedom not to contract, so to reject the contract if I don't like the other party, um, except the law states otherwise. Um, the freedom of contract includes the freedom to, uh, to determine the content of a contract. So I can you know, regulate it in my contract, whatever I want to. It includes the freedom to terminate a contract, and it includes the freedom to use automatic decision for all the above, which is a special problem to which I'll come back. Let's start, let me go through these three points quickly. Um, it has been, a, I'm, I'm starting with German case law. It has been established that even um, that, for example, internet or e-commerce um, sellers have no obligation to contract with all potential customers, but they can reject contracts. Um, one of the sort of landmark decisions on that, which has never been disputed ever since, was of um, the Higher Regional Court of Hamburg in, as soon as in um, 2004 on Otto Fassand, which was one of the the classic catalog um, providers in Germany. <clears throat> um, one of the, they had a system of sort of blacklisting consumers who returned too many products, using, making use of their right of withdrawal, um, a practice that we also find with Amazon and, and the likes nowadays. <clears throat> and the consumer complained about not having been a bad guy, but having had good reasons didn't help him, freedom of contract. Um, the court decided that they could make a contract or otherwise. 
Um, there are, of course, exceptions, certain exceptions, in particular when it comes to services of general interest, such as electricity, um, gas, telecommunications, water, nowadays basic banking, which is where the legislator has decided that these services are so essential that everybody needs to have access at least to one service provider. Um, and then there, there is more generally, now this comes more from competition law, uh, an obligation to contract under the essential facilities doctrine or similar concepts so if there is absolutely no other uh, operator in the market or say in, in reach. <clears throat> and there are of course limitations by anti-discrimination but I don't want to get into anti-discrimination laws here. When it comes to the price, so to personalized pricing, um, we also have a clear point of view 1958, of course, personal pricing by algorithms hasn't been invented yet at the time, but personal pricing has been invented. And the um, BGH, Bundesgerichtshof, the Federal Supreme Court of Germany, um, stated freedom of contract includes the right to charge different customers different prices unless special aggravating circumstances are in place. So in principle, anybody can charge anybody different prices. And that has uh, just been confirmed, or is just being confirmed, by Recital 45 of the forthcoming Directive on Better Enforcement and Modernization of EU Consumer Protection Rules. i read it out. Traders may personalize the price of their offers for specific consumers or specific categories of consumers based on automated decision-making and profiling of consumer behavior, allowing traders to assess the consumer's purchasing power. Now, once this has, uh, will be sealed in stone, or um, there is no way to go around this at the national level anymore because this will be a full harmonization directive. Um, again, there are some limits by anti-discrimination laws. Coming to terms and conditions, of course, same problem. You can determine them with, within the limits of unfair contract terms law. But um, for the problems that I've mentioned before, Unfair, unfair um, contract terms law hasn't played any role yet. It's pretty useless when it comes to personalized pricing because they are ideally not laid down in the standard terms of a com company. Automatic decisions. So, say, the aggravation of all this in the sense that it is not a human being that decides not to want a contract or to impose a higher price on someone than on someone else. <clears throat> Automated decision has so far only been dealt with by the general data protection regulation that has already been mentioned and previous data protection law. And uh, to cut a, a long story short, it has, it is pretty, the, well, the rules in there are pretty useless. Um, <clears throat> Article 22 seems to cover the problem by saying the data subject, which is us, um, the citizens slash consumers, shall have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal effects concerning him or her, or similarly significantly affects him or her. Um, leaving aside the facts that nobody knows what this really means, and it has been controversially discussed what solely means and what legal effects are, and what affects the data subject similarly significantly, and you could argue that all this includes the, um, the conditions of a contract that is offered. Um, there are wide exceptions in, in paragraph two that defeat all the above because <clears throat> um, there is an exception where this is necessary for entering into a contract and this is um, interpreted extremely broadly by practitioners or by commentators and includes everything that is relevant for a contract. And one thing that is quite relevant for the contract is the creditworthiness of the other party, or the, um, the, the prospects of being paid. And this may therefore be decided on by automated decisions. So forget about data protection law, it doesn't help. Um, what we get now is at least a new information obligation in the Consumer Rights Directive, which reads that um, 
<clears throat> there must be information where applicable that the price was personalized on the basis of automated decision making. This has come in on pressure of the consumer organizations, by Boyk in particular. Um, but at the last moment, and it, I don't think it has been well thought through, because first, it only relates to pricing, but not to exclusion. So um, you must be informed that your price may be personalized, but not the ex decision that you don't get a contract in the first place. Then it will be in the Consumer Rights Directive, which has a very limited scope of application, and in particular, it excludes all financial services, including credit. So the scope of application of that information obligation is pretty limited and does not cover the most relevant issues, which is, amongst others, credit. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned credit scoring as a problem. Credit scoring is a um, bit different from the above because it's not a direct relationship, but it's a background service. So you don't have a relationship between the um, consumer and the credit rating agency, but the credit rating agency provides a service to traders which then make use of the credit score in their relations to consumers. So we're not in a contractual relationship here. Um, which, but the effects are even greater because they're, um, they're, it, the credit rating agency and the credit score kind of acts as a multiple, um, multiplier because it's then used by everybody. I'll get back to that when I get to Shufa. On scoring again, there is something in the general data protection regulation and again it's pretty useless. Um, <clears throat> you have the right to know what data is used and what logic is involved in automated decision making. Um, the question is what does involved logic means. Um, and we, are ex we have experience with that because we've had that discussion on a previous rule, a uh, similar rule in German law for at least 10, 15 years without a satisfactory solution. Um, the question is, if the consumer knows which data goes into the score, he or she still doesn't know why the score is, how the result came into being. You would, for, for that, you would have to know how the data is weighed, um, <clears throat> how the result would be if factor X would be different, um, or ideally, what algorithm has been used. Um, one lady has brought this case up through the court system, up to the Bundesgerichtshof, has failed badly there, because Bundesgerichtshof um, argued that all this is a business secret and therefore protected and you can't know. She only wanted to know whether the, her score would have been the same had she not been female but male. Um, well, nobody told her. She still doesn't know. She went to constitutional court, but the constitutional court hasn't accepted the case for decision. So let me finish my first point, the, ones, the one that I'm safe about. Consumer contract law is useless, data protection law is useless, um, which from a consumer perspective is kind of depressing, but we're not giving up that easily, and therefore we try to find a solution elsewhere and move to unknown ground, which is constitutional law. From a constitu constitutional law po um, perspective, the starting point, of course, is a difficult one, which is it is only binding public authorities according to our constitution. And we're talking about Facebook and the like, and they are not public authorities. There have been tra some traditional ex exceptions, though, where the courts have accepted a direct or an indirect application of fundamental rights and private law relationships. I won't say too much about that because that's um, Olga's domain for the next talk. But the traditional exceptions have been employment relationships, and they have been made in, t in the context of personality, personality rights in Germany. What we got though, and I hope this is something that I can now throw into the debate because it's fairly new in Germany, is a very new judgment of the um, Federal Constitutional Court that has opened up kind of a new category. And the category is the following. It's a judgment of 2018, and it concerned the dramatic exclusion of a football fan from all the matches of the German Bundesliga by 
a private actor, the Deutsche Fußballliga, so the German Football Association. Um, we had, of course, as some other countries, I guess, this hooligan issue. And um, the trick to limit hooliganism was meant to be to exclude them. And not only from one stadium, but from the whole series. Problem was that this um, hooligan slash football fan thought that um, his exclusion was unfair and he um, sued his way through the courts, ending up in the uh, Federal Constitutional Court, which came up with the following statement. The fundamental right to equality does not amount to a general obligation of private actors to treat all private persons equally. Well, of course, that's our starting point. But this is different where a private actor offers goods or services to the public at large and makes far-reaching decisions on the participation of others in social life, brackets, football. In this situation, the private actor must not exclude others arbitrarily, and that's the point, uh, from access to his goods or services. Instead, he must provide objective reasons that justify his decisions, which is connected with procedural requirements, in particular the right to be heard. So what the Federal Constitutional Court has done here is basically applied the right to equality directly to that powerful private actor, the one that governs access to Bundesliga matches. Um, <clears throat> The judgment has been um, discussed highly controversially in academic writing. There was a lot of resistance against it, saying oh, there was no need to create that new category and even more um, as much as the indirect effect of fundamental rights has been clarified many years ago in German law. This here is about direct effect, uh, a direct application of the right to equality rather than indirect. But leaving that aside, the more interesting issue for me, for me here is that lower instance courts have uh, started to apply this judgment to other powerful actors, and in particular to Facebook. Starting with a, um, a judgment by the Regional Court of Frankfurt, this was on the deletion of a post and a 30 days ban of the account for allegedly insulting comments on a newspaper, left-wing newspaper. Um, <clears throat> here the court referred to the Bundesliga decision but didn't apply to the right to equality but to the fundamental right of free speech, arguing that um, the post was covered by free speech and therefore Facebook had no right to delete it and to block the account. Similarly, the Landgericht Berlin has uh, decided on the deletion of a post and the 30 days ban, that's the standard measure of Facebook. Um, for a pro-Ukrainian comment that Facebook interpreted to offend Russia. Again, the court thought, well, on a proper construction of what he was said, it was not really nice about Russia, but it was, not, it was covered by, the, uh, by freedom of speech. And therefore, the court wasn't, um, the Facebook wasn't allowed to simply delete it. Um, in contrast to the Landgericht Frankfurt decision, this court um, applied the Bundesliga decision because of the power imbalance. So the power of the digital actor Facebook, rather than referring to freedom of speech. The Constitutional Court hasn't decided on Facebook yet, but there is a case pending where we have an interim decision. And this was a case um, quite recently on the ban of the account and ban uh, of a right-wing political party, I mean, very much right-wing, um, Der Dritte Weg, uh, they were pretty down on the list, didn't make it to the European Parliament, but they're there. <clears throat> they got banned right before the European elections, and they complained that they were sort of blocked in their political uh, right to approach the voters because Facebook was such an important um, channel for them to which the Federal uh, Constitutional Court agreed. I so, said, well, we're not making a final decision here, but the risk not to be able to convey messages to a large audience, because the Facebook account is blocked, uh, weighs higher than the, pretend, the, the right of Facebook to block accounts for hate speech. I mean, this was about hate speech. 
very right-wing party. <clears throat> so we don't know yet. Uh, to give a, a few other examples, uh, uh, recent examples where again the Bundesliga case was mentioned, one on YouTube, again a, a video was deleted because of alleged hate speech and the court thought that this video was still covered by freedom of speech. Um, PayPal, here a PayPal was, uh, account was banned. Um, I think it was because PayPal alleged the um, account owner to make um, deals with Iran, which is problematic when it comes to the US uh, sanctions on companies that deal with uh, Iran. So PayPal was nervous that they could be sanctioned by the US for having such a client. Um, again here, the court thought that the account owner uh, could not be banned because he could not um, the, this uh, blocking could not be compensated adequately by other payment methods. Um, Twitter has been mentioned, if we think of the US president, as one immensely important route of communicating with potential voters. Um, Amazon, of course, is a candidate because they have enormous market power in Germany. Um, they control more than 50% of the ele uh, electronic commerce nowadays, market nowadays. And um, not only do they have their immediate relationship with customers, but they also, by their standard terms, control the relationship of all the other traders on the Amazon marketplace with customers, and so on. Of course, this list is uh, way beyond any sort of certainty, which is why it has been criticized, or why, say, the new cate category has been criticized heavily, say, in the sense of how should private actors know whether they are now bound by constitutional rights, whether they are big enough, important enough, powerful enough to come under the new rules. Um, I think, for sure, I'm running out of time, so going a bit quicker perhaps. Shufa is more indirect, as I mentioned earlier, but at least as powerful as the rest because um, it is absolutely decisive on the German market for access to um, contracts, not only to credit, but also Shufa scores are nowadays used by housing companies, electricity companies, um, gas suppliers, telecommunications, uh, and so on. So with a crappy Shufa core, you're basically excluded from anything that is important, or at least you will get more unfavorable conditions like higher interest rates, etc. So to me, in my mind, the Bundesliga logic seems to apply to that as well. Now, if um, the right to equality should apply, which I leave to your debate, um, the question is, what does it mean? What does it mean you can't be treated arbitrarily? Now, the classic instruments against arbitrary treatment in public law is the right to be given reasons, and the right to be given reasons that one can understand, so that one is able to, um, to reflect on the decision, to control it, and to challenge it if one feels that it is incorrect. Um, here, one would probably have to say that a mere score 42, is not good enough to uh, a reason that one could understand, control, and challenge um, for a decision. The alternative to that, of course, would be control by independent third parties, and this has been the, the root of um, German data protection in the past. So, whereas consumers could not assess or could not assess the reasons for their score, um, the data protection authorities had the right to control the scientific um, methods in which the score has been cal calculated. First, it may be doubted that they have actually done it because there are so, so many scores out there and so few data protection authorities. So it has been seriously doubted that this works in the first place. And a second problem, which is um, adding to that is that nowadays scores are increasingly calculated by self or self-learning algorithms. So even if you have controlled one, it may have learned something else on the next day and it may be different from what you have uh, controlled before. 
<clears throat> if there was a right to equality here, this would mean, <clears throat> probably, that you would have to give reasons for the rejection of a customer if you are a powerful actor. Or if you don't have a good reason, this would probably amount to an obligation to contract. Um, you would have to give good reasons why your, your price is different from someone else's price. You would have to good, uh, give good reasons for the termination or the blocking of an account. Um, and perhaps most importantly, you would have to have a right to be informed on why your credit score is your credit score, and not why it's not different, better in, in particular. Well, I'm leaving that open for a bit. This was German law, and some sort of bold conclusions on it. Is, that, is, is there a possibility that this could apply at the EU level in any way, or are the member states, well, this is even more slippery ground for me. Um, I'm a bit skeptical about the Charter of Fundamental Rights because it has this um, narrow scope of, of application only meant to be uh, addressed to the institutions, bodies, offices and agencies of the Union and to the member states. Facebook is difficult to bring under that description. <clears throat> Otherwise, EU seems to be much more open to uh, recognizing that powerful actors, private actors, um, may come under the same kind of ob obligations than states. We have seen that in primary EU law, with cases like Angonese, Racanelli, uh, with fundamental freedoms like Bosman, Laval, Frabo, and so on, which is, was all about um, private actors obstructing access to markets or discriminating in the cases of Angonese and Racanelli. And also in EU secondary law, we find this sort of this idea of equality and obligation to contract, at least in anti-discrimination law and in the area of services of general interest. So in principle, this should work, except that the Charter of Fundamental Rights probably isn't open to that yet. Let me conclude. From, from a consumer or citizen's perspective, decisions that are not explained are arbitrary. In public law, the remedy is the right to be given reasons on the basis of which one then could challenge that decision. And in private law, the same should apply to these kind of powerful private actors that I described before, including, for example, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Amazon, Shufa. It may change. Some may get more power, some get le may get less power. They may be less power through more competition, etc which, of course, is a problem in terms of legal certainty. The same applies to automated decision. Giving a reason doesn't mean giving a score, but explaining the score. Um, whether self-learning algorithms can be explained is the next question. I seriously doubt it. Would that mean that you can't use self-learning algorithms? Business operators wouldn't like that idea. Um, and therefore, I'm very careful about it and simply ask the question to you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Do we have questions to Peter? <laughs> now the constitutional oh, okay. lawyers catch me. No, actually, surprisingly, completely contrary to our nature, I want to help. Um, no, I think actually um, the Court of Justice may have come to your aid this year because they have for the first time accepted direct horizontal application of the Charter now, even to private um, entities. So never doubt the Court's willingness to expand EU law uh, even further. So I think you can even strengthen it based on the Charter now, uh, where they, they applied Charter rights to private employers. Um, in a similar way as, as uh, Jones, I can give you the, the case numbers uh, uh, later if, if you want, because I, I, don't have them, I don't have them ready from the top of my head. Um, and then I think indeed another trick the Court of Justice has used, and actually it was funny because when you were describing the German case law, it triggered the specifically cases like Frabo in, in my mind, because 
if I read Frabo very technically, then the court doesn't directly apply free movement of goods horizontally, but says that the power that Frabo exercises in, in its certification of these gas fittings is equal to a public authority. So it's part, uh, the court has two solutions. It first expanded the concept of a public authority to encompass anyone exercising kind of public authority. And then when even that wasn't enough, it just accepted horizontal direct application immediately. Um, and I think Frabo is in the latter line. And the question then comes to my mind, could we indeed by now say that companies like Amazon de facto exercise powers that are equal to a public authority? Uh, that would be an EU law question. Yeah, you know that in, in Frabo, um, Frabo actually sued the German certification body in court for damages. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the case was settled, ah. but they, it looked good for them, for Frabo. That's why it was settled. Ah. Yeah, horrible when they settle cases. These yeah, lawyers. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> no? Any other questions? And of course, Laval was the same. Uh, Laval, Laval was successfully sued in the Swedish court. Um, I don't know how much it's question, how much, how much uh, comment uh, about this freedom of expression cases you mentioned, because in German, according to this new German law, basically you have to basically remove and remove things. And when you impose on private actors this obligations and you have two fundamental rights. You have freedom of expression, which you said, and then you have protection of privacy or protection of person's dignity. Then you basically impose on private actors to do this balancing, which has been traditionally done by courts. And how, whether these cases you mentioned were so straightforward that they just ignored the other rights, uh, these private actors, so how this basically goes in line with this also new German law, which is also pending in constitutional court on basically on liability of Facebook and other big social media for basically not removing hate speech. Thank you. It's a huge problem, of course, in practice. Um, on the one hand, under German law, these, uh, the social media are required to re remove hate speech immediately. On the other hand, they now shall have the same competence as court to decide whether hate speech is hate speech or just not hate enough speech. Um, it's extremely difficult, yes. And uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's a bit of the irony that a, um, a, a development that I, in principle, find a good idea, so to um, impose fundamental rights on powerful private actors, uh, basically helps the hate, speed, hate speakers at the moment. Well, well, there you go. <laughs> Thank you for a very interesting topic. It's absolutely fantastic and you have so many layers. And uh, re regarding the last point, just, you know, it is quite common to talk about it in the terms of, you know, helping the hate speakers, like you say. I followed this phenomenon from the other angle. I see people uh, on Facebook and YouTube trying to express uh, views that are not modern in terms of, like, they say that abortion is bad or um, homosexuals don't get married and these kind of topics. And they have got people ac actively reporting their accounts and the accounts being temporarily frozen and closed because of campaigns from the other side. And uh, it, to me, it's always the question about uh, freedom of speech, that how does it only work in the modern way? I mean, is it <laughs> are the companies also liable to endorse, you know, conservatists' views or allow them to express themselves? I mean, independent of what I believe personally, it's just mm -hmm. a question that it seems that it's, uh, if you can't speak on YouTube and Facebook, then you basically don't exist. All right, and I think um, it's, it's exactly these efforts of groups of interest groups to block the accounts of the other side that shows the immense power of these social media and um, the reason why there may be a reason to uh, impose constitutional or, uh, or fundamental rights on them or obligations to observe fundamental rights. But yeah, I mean, it's a practical problem as well, not only a doctrinal one. <laughs>